Hi, this is Dale Whitman welcoming you to PropDale's property video number seven. In the previous video, we covered the fee simple absolute and fee simple defeasible. And in this video, we're going to cover two additional estates, the fee tail and the life estate. We'll start with the fee tail. But before we start, let's go back to the chart of interests in land that we created back in video number five. Here we can see highlighted the two additional estates that we're going to cover in this video. The fee can either be a fee simple, which we've already covered, or a fee tail. A freehold estate can either be a fee estate, which we'll have fully covered when we cover fee tails here, or it can be a life estate. So that's the picture into which the life estate and the fee tail are going to fit. Let's start with the fee tail. It was developed in England in the 13th century and was a result of the fact that many Norman barons had been given huge estates in England by William I as rewards for their helping him with the Norman conquest. These barons did not want the land to pass out of their families, and so the fee tail was their attempt to keep land in their families through successive generations. To look at the language that was used to create the fee tail, the standard language was to A and the heirs of his or her body. Now that sounds similar to the language that was used to create the fee simple, namely to A and his or to her heirs. But it's a little different. The words of purchase, the words that tell who's receiving the interest, are the words to A in this example. But the words of limitation that tell what type of interest is being conveyed are the words heirs of the body. That's as distinguished from the fee simple estate where the words were simply and his heirs or and her heirs. So the heirs of the body language was necessary to create a fee tail. Now we need to think a bit about what the term heirs of the body or bodily heirs really means. We start with the definition of heirs. And an heir is a person who, under the intestate succession statute of a particular state, is entitled to receive a decedent's property if the decedent dies without a will. Now, at the common law, heirs were very narrowly defined to include only the offspring of the decedent. But today, they're much more broadly defined to include not only your offspring, but potentially your spouse, your ancestors, and collateral relatives as well. So heirs today is a much bigger class of persons than heirs at common law was. However, when we say heirs of the body, we're narrowing the definition of heirs, even today, to include only the offspring. The idea of the body was that only the offspring would be included. So that means that only children grandchildren and great-grandchildren could be heirs of the body of a decedent. Let's take a look at the way the common law fee tail would actually operate. If O deeds to A and the heirs of his body, A is what we call the first taker of the property, and A would hold the property during A's lifetime. When A died, the property would pass to A's bodily heir. Let's assume that A only has one bodily heir, and we'll call him B, and B would hold the property during B's lifetime. When B died, it would pass to B's bodily heir. Let's assume that that would be C. So you can think of the fee tail as a sort of chain of bodily heirs, one after another, each party holding a life estate and stretching on out forever. If the chain of bodily heirs ever ran out, someone simply didn't have any offspring, then the, the end of the fee tail would arrive and the property would revert back to the original grantor who had created the fee tail, or if that person was dead, to his or her heirs. Suppose one of these parties tried to make a conveyance outside the family. For example, B might execute a deed of the property to X, an outsider. X would hold the property and could use it and occupy it, but only as long as B was alive. And as soon as B died, that would be the end of X's, in effect, life estate, and X's property would then pass back to C, the next bodily heir after B, 
in the chain of bodily heirs. The fee tale has a fascinating history in England. As we've already mentioned, in the 13th century, the wealthy landowning families invented the fee tale estate to try to keep the land within their families. But the courts did not like that result at all because they felt that it tied up land within the family and made it virtually impossible to develop the property unless the family itself had the resources and skill to do so. And so the courts immediately began to hold that what was intended to be a fee tail would be construed instead as what they called a fee simple conditional. And by fee simple conditional, what they meant was that as soon as issue were born alive to the first taker, the first taker could convey a fee simple. So in other words, as soon as the first taker had a child, the first taker could give somebody else a fee simple, and that would be the end of the fee tale. Well, the wealthy families did not like that result, and so in 1285, they got Parliament to pass the statute De Donis Conditionalibus. The statute simply said to the courts, stop doing that. Instead of reconstruing the fee tail as a fee simple conditional, construe it the way the wealthy families want it to be construed, as a fee tail estate that will stay in the family. The courts, however, were not very deterred by the statute conditionalibus, and so within a few years, the courts began to frustrate the intent of the statute by allowing fictitious lawsuits to be created that would, as they put it, bar the entail. And by barring the entail, what they meant was basically that an owner who held a fee tail could come into court by using one of these fictitious lawsuits, could convert it into a fee simple estate. So ultimately in England, the courts won this contest and the fee tail was defeated and it was permitted for anybody who owned one to convert it into a fee simple estate. So where does that leave the fee tail in the various United States states today? Probably the most common result is that it's simply deemed to be a fee simple absolute estate. Here's the DC statute, but many states have similar ones. It says all estates of inheritance, including such as were formerly estates tail, shall be adjudged estates in fee simple. That's probably the majority view. A second possibility is a few courts say the fee tail does operate, but if one of the owners, including the very first taker, makes a conveyance, it becomes a fee simple absolute upon inter vivos transfer. That means transfer by a deed. Another possibility is as in, they say in South Carolina, the fee tail becomes a fee simple conditional. Remember the fee simple conditional said that as soon as there was issue born alive to the first taker, then the first taker could convey a fee simple absolute. A further possibility which several states follow is that it's deemed to be a life estate in the first taker with a remainder in fee simple to his or her lineal descendants. Florida, Arkansas, and Missouri are among the states that have that type of statute. It turns out that can be quite convoluted and can give rise to a fair amount of litigation. But the principle is that ultimately it will become a fee simple estate. The common law fee tail estate is still recognized in a few states, including Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, and Delaware. So what do you need to know about the fee tail estate today? Well, in reality, not very much. First, you need to be able to recognize it by looking at that heirs of the body language and saying, yep, that's a fee tail. Second, you need to know what your particular state's law says about the fee tail. And as I indicated, the majority or most common view is that it's treated simply like a fee simple absolute. That completes our discussion of the fee tail estate. And now it's time to turn to the other main topic of this video, the life estate. Now, the principle of the life estate, of course, is that the property will remain in someone's ownership, but only as long as they're alive. The standard language is simply that, oh, the owner of the property makes a deed or a will that says, I convey this property to A for life. 
I want you to notice that in this situation, A is really fulfilling two different roles. First of all, A is obviously the owner of the life estate. But second, A's life is the measuring life for the life estate. In other words, the estate will end when A dies. So A is both the owner and the measuring life. This is, of course, the most common situation. Most usually, the owner of the life estate and the measuring life are the same person. However, it isn't essential that the two be the same. Suppose O makes a deed that says to A for the life of V. Can you do that? Is that permitted? The answer is, it's perfectly fine. It's okay for the grantor to designate someone other than the person receiving the life estate to be the measuring life for the life estate. Notice that here, the ownership and the measuring life are two different people. A is the owner. B is the measuring life. Now, what happens to the property if B dies? Well, the answer, of course, is that since B is the measuring life, when B dies, that will be the end of A's life estate. A will have to move off the property, even though A is still living, and the property's possession will revert to O, the owner. On the other hand, what happens if A dies and B is still alive? Well, the answer is the life estate continues, even though A dies, and so it will pass to A's successors. That might be A's heirs if A dies without a will, A's devisees if A dies with a will, or if A has deeded away the property to somebody else during A's life, that person will get to keep the property so long as B continues alive. B's the measuring life, and so the estate will only end when B dies, and then it will revert back and O will regain possession of it again. Now let's think about what happens if someone holds a life estate and makes a conveyance, a deed for example, to someone else. Here we start off with a garden variety life estate, O conveys to A for life. Later, A conveys to B. What does B get? Well, we already know that a deed is presumed to convey everything that you hold. In general, if you have a fee simple absolute estate, that will pass by a deed. But if you don't have a fee simple absolute, your deed will nevertheless pass whatever lesser estate you might have. In this case, A has a lesser estate, namely a life estate, and therefore that's what B gets. So now B is the holder of a life estate, but it's for the life of another because the measuring life for the life estate doesn't change when the life estate is transferred to B. A is still the measuring life. So B, as we said, has an estate for the life of another, namely for A's life. So what happens to the land if B dies, but A is still alive? Well, the property's ownership in B doesn't end when B dies because A is the measuring life. And so the property will pass to B's successors. That could be B's heirs if B dies without a will. Could be B's uh, devisees if B dies with a will. Or if B is conveyed to somebody else, they'll still have the property. Whoever it is that is the successor of B will get to keep the property until A dies, and then it will revert back to the original grantor. Likewise, what happens if A dies, but B is still alive? Well, because A is the measuring life, that, the, that is the end of B's life estate. And B will have to move off the property, even though B is still living, and the property will revert in possession to O, the original grantor. So that leaves us with the following question. Would you want to buy a life estate? If you were looking for real estate, a house to live in, or real estate to develop in some way, how would you feel about buying a life estate? Well, the answer is, unless you also happen to be a high stakes gambler, you probably are not interested in the least. The reason is that if you buy a life estate, since the original owner's life remains the measuring life, if the original owner dies, Immediately, that's the end of your life estate. Well, almost nobody who's interested in buying or uh, developing or occupying property wants to be subject to that sort of risk. So as a practical matter, there really isn't any market for life estates.
Now we're going to wind up by talking about a kind of a fun little terminological issue with life estates. If the ownership of the life estate and the measuring life are different people, we have a couple of names that we can give to the life estate. The standard English way of expressing it is simply that it's an estate for the life of another. But if you like to speak law French, you can use the law French terminology that was used back in the early English common law. It's called an estate per auteur v, which is simply French for estate for the life of another. And that's the end of our discussion of life estates. In our next video, video eight, we'll provide an introduction to the wonderful topic of future interests. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. And thanks for watching.